Very good morning to you. Hope you're doing well. Friday 19th of March. And before I begin the briefing, just a reminder for the latest Market Watch podcast with myself and Head of Trading, Piers Curran. I'm going to record that in a few hours' time and we'll publish it later today. So all you've got to do is either go to amplifylive.com slash podcast and or you can just go to the individual podcast platforms on Spotify and Apple. Just search for Market Watch and you'll be able to find it. So an uh, informal chat that Piers and I have at the end of every week. And uh, this week, probably we're going to talk about the Fed a little bit. Uh, and we'll talk about this whole kind of vaccine situation ongoing between the UK and Europe. So if you want to get our latest insights on that, the podcast is the best place to go. And don't forget to subscribe and, and leave a review. That would be amazing. Uh, otherwise, look, let's get straight into the briefing and, and talk about what's going on today. And really, yesterday was, was an interesting one. Um, we did say on Wednesday, after the initial reaction to the FOMC, we obviously saw um, a kind of dovish response in the sense that equities move higher, dollar weakened considerably, which helped support the major pairs. But if you look at where the major pairs are trading now, top left corner, euro dollar is completely kind of scratched from where we are. Or where we were prior to the Fed announcement coming out. So basically flat Xing out that, that pop that we saw. Same kind of case with, with cable to that extent. Equities obviously reversed course uh, after moving up to record high territory. The key here, I think, to, to understand these moves is, um, as we were kind of uh, alluding to, was the reaction effect that we had on Wednesday, our view was down to kind of misplaced market expectations about looking for something more hawkish, particularly around that dot plot moving forward to a rate hike sooner rather than later, which didn't materialize, of course. There were some other things, but that was the main kind of take home. The ultimate point here, though, is that in those um, summary of economic projections, growth in America is going, as per their projections, to move up to around the mid 6% region by the end of the year is what they're looking at as their base case scenario. And so growth is going to um, substantially improve in the US as we go through the reopening with the stimulus in the system, more infrastructure spending to come, uh, COVID cases thankfully improving in the States, vaccinations picking up rapidly and the reopening of the economy. And so with that then, you know, yields will rise as the economy grows. Uh, and so I think yesterday was a really good uh, reflection of that. And in the US 10 year, we broke below what was a, a key kind of trading band, I guess, that we were trading for a quite a period of time, which was, um, if I just mark it up here, was this, this area going back to the beginning of March, which was 131.23 to around the 132 low uh, kind of figure. And we broke out through that um, really more forcefully uh, in the session uh, two days ago. We bounced back through there though on the, the release of the Fed, but then yesterday we broke the lower bound of that and we actually saw the US 10 year yield move above 1.75% for a fleeting period of time, which was a 14 month high uh, before kind of retreating back to around 1.72%. Um, what does this mean then, generally speaking? Well, equities not liking it, and obviously the high yield environment tends to hit growth stocks the hardest, and so tech underperforming, the NASDAQ was down in excess of 3% comparative to the Dow down just a half percent. So the regular kind of reflection of that high yield environment in the equity sector kind of space. Um, in the equity market, I know it feels uh, feels quite heavy, but you know I think context is quite key. We we are at record high territories. We've come off and uh, we've responded here in the S and P around thirty nine hundred, which is a key kind of strategic point of support in the near term price action for the month of March. You can see here going back to uh, the beginning of the first of March, the initial tests and breakthrough to come back to bounce off that as a support area on the twelfth. Uh, and then again in the recent last 24 hours as well. So a key area to watch there um, going forward. The other market that obviously moved substantially yesterday was oil. Uh, saw quite aggressive breakdown in price. In fact, uh, at one point for the session, we were down almost 10%, which obviously is a, a correction in, in those percentage terms. Um, the rationale behind that, there were some kind of tenuous links drawn between the fact that 
uh, mainland Europe continues to um, confront a fairly challenging COVID situation, case rates going up in Italy uh, and France, the latter being the latest to impose more stringent lockdowns on the capital city and other regions like what we've seen in Italy. And, and subsequently, that is going to have a degree of demand impact. But overall, I think you had a bit of a technical breakdown in price that drawed in some of the kind of more momentum based speculators uh, just driving that fast money move uh, and the market just traded quite heavy from that point not as well forgetting that yesterday was a resurgent dollar day reversing the entirety of the move that we had on the weakness and the knee-jerk reaction on the back of the fed on wednesday so overall there was a couple of factors there i think that explained that move in particular uh, if you look at the daily chart um, i always think you know perspective on a higher time frame is quite key and you know, we look how far we've rallied since November. I mean, this is an incredible move. So look, let's quickly look at this on percentage terms, going from the low that we printed on the second of November. You know, we have rallied 102 percent. I might add, in terms of the price to the high that we've seen just a short while ago. So to come off and now trade down 11 percent after a hundred plus percent rally, I don't think is 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 too much cause for concern at this point. I have marked up here on the daily chart a couple of key areas that I would be keeping an eye on. We've threatened but failed to close below the low area of the 3rd of March. I think that technically was quite important for price here. So quite a key support area to look out for now for price at 59.24. Even if we did break that, then I'd look back down to the high we have on the 5th and then that kind of double bottom on the 9th and 12th of Feb as the next support area down at 57.32. And even then, don't forget, uh, we're talking about a correction move down of what 15% off that 100 plus uh, percent move that we've seen over the course of the last three months or so. So again, I still, um, although it was heavy yesterday, I, I kind of agree. I heard a comment from Goldman Sachs um, from uh, earlier this morning. They said that they expect OPEC plus output to increase by 2.8 million barrels per day in August uh, and see Brent rising to 80 bucks in the summer uh, while it views yesterday's sell-off as a transient pullback in a larger oil price rally and a buying opportunity. Uh, and you know, I'm not putting all my, all my eggs in the Goldman basket, but I do believe in a, a similar kind of view in the sense that uh, lower prices will get bought into, I think is how the market will, will, will see this strategically. Um, all right, well, Lower close then on Wall Street, a little bit of a bounce off the lows here in equities um, as some of these find some strategic kind of support at lower levels. So as I said in the S&P, quite a key level. There's another level here as well in the NASDAQ that looks equally uh, like a good area that the market has responded to from some of the price activity of previous resistance and support. And uh, we're just popping out above the Asia pack range here actually as we're delivering this. So moving back up around 50 points now in the, the NASDAQ future ahead of the open. Um, but overnight in Asia, it was a little bit uh, of a case of just picking up the negative handover from uh, what we saw in the close on the US. Also, there's a couple of things to be aware of that were happening in the Asia PAC session, uh, namely Chinese equities a little bit softer. We've had our first kind of first high level talks between US uh, and China since the Biden administration have come in and it descended into bickering is what Bloomberg is suggesting um, and each side criticizing each other over human rights trade and international alliances so we weren't looking for much in the way of any kind of tangible outcome uh, of substance from these talks it's the first meeting so it's very much just kind of feeling each other out um, some people were looking at the fact that the um, a slightly more friendly atmosphere might be received as a slight positive for markets even without any definitive kind of results on these talks but seemingly so far um, both are trying to uh, just hold their stance at these first kind of meetings and that has um, been received a little bit negative in the overnight session but so far it's not really impeding uh, the kind of slight recovery we're seeing here at the European Open so I don't think you could have expected too much more than what's happened, perhaps some well in with a little bit of a higher expectation of hopes of a slightly friendlier mood and that hasn't materialized as yet, but obviously they're gonna have more talks coming up uh, in the coming weeks. The other thing then from the overnight session was the BOJ. Um, they had their kind of review after a lengthy policy um, 
look at the tools that they're, they're currently using. And what they came out with was they set out a wider than previously thought movement range for bond yields, and they scrapped a buying target for stock funds at the end of their three month policy review. So basically they, they've scrapped the six trillion yen ETF buying target. Um, and they've kept the higher bound threshold of 12 trillion. And one of the other key things here that did weigh on the Nikkei 225 last night was the fact that the bank's decision to only focus on the topics. So that's like the broader Tokyo based um, indexed rather than the kind of more um, kind of familiar Nikkei. Um, and so broadening out that purchasing just the topics moves away the purchasing of the Nikkei and that consequently had a bit of a negative impact there as well. Um, so all in all, as we were kind of suggesting at the very beginning of the week when we we're looking at the whole uh, kind of events to be aware of for the week ahead, um, the BOJ definitely a bit of a domestic impact there. The yen, not really too much of a great deal of movement, again, still with the, the greenback kind of dictating proceedings for much of the G10 kind of currencies at the moment. Um, so I wouldn't really look at the BOJ as something that's going to really impact the UK, European, US assets that we're trading this morning. Um, talking of um, vaccines, just a brief update. There's been a lot of uh, drama, of course, about uh, rising political tension between Europe and the UK uh, in regard to, to vaccines, particularly on the, uh, the Astra drug. But uh, following the EMA uh, kind of announcement yesterday, Germany, France, Spain, Italy have all going to uh, reverse course. And they've said that um, now that that EMA investigation is concluded and the vaccine was not associated with the potential risk of blood clots, uh, adding that the benefits in the shot outweigh any possible risks, they're all going to recommence that, uh, the usage of that vaccine. Uh, meanwhile, elsewhere in France, I did briefly mention uh, that Macron's government has put Paris and several other regions under stricter lockdown conditions for a third time. Hospitals running out of intensive care beds for COVID-19 patients at the moment. Uh, and slightly worryingly that their COVID case rates continue to climb at the moment. Uh, in fact, I don't think that this, this latest move is particularly surprising, uh, and I don't think you should really think of it as a real net negative for something like the Euro, for example. And the reason for that is, is that it's not really a surprise. If you've been tracking the daily infection rates of new COVID cases in France, they have risen to 30,000 nationally in recent days. And that is up more than 20% in a week. So on the point of the, the actuality of COVID cases worsening, it's almost inevitable that the government's got to take some kind of, kind of action to uh, try and control in the particular hotspots. Um, and then also it's been fairly well telegraphed in the press that this was going to happen. Um, so all in all, what does that mean for France specifically? Well, the new restrictions, according to analysts, are expected, or well, according to the finance ministry, in fact, in France, are expected to knock off around 0.2 percentage points from French GDP and its annual economic output. Uh, the monthly cost of compensating furloughed workers and closed businesses is also going to rise up to around 7.2 billion, uh, which is just over a billion more than what they previously were expecting in the government forecast. Um, so that's the latest there. And then the final thing I wanted to mention was um, the calendar today. It is pretty quiet. There's not really anything major coming out. Um, you've got CAD retail sales, but everything else is kind of a, a bit of a side point, quite frankly. And so with a quiet calendar, the other thing to be mindful of is this, which is quadruple witching. So specifically relevant for equity traders. What is quadruple witching? Well, just to refresh you, uh, and your memory, uh, if you are relatively new to markets, then it refers to the date of which derivatives of stock index futures, stock index options, stock options, single stock futures all expire simultaneously. Um, and so the main point here is that while it may result in increased volume and arbitrage opportunities, quadruple watching doesn't not necessarily translate to increased volatility to, for markets, but you can witness heavy trading volumes. So essentially just going back to the timings here they are slightly different there tends to be like a, a uniform pattern the FTSE followed by the Eurostox the DAX US uh, indices at the market open uh, and then the cap current later on in the afternoon so it's just about around the times of explorations to be aware of those if you are trading those particular products um, but that is it so from a technical point of view I'll let the guys come on on Amplify live stream 
shortly and they can run through the charts as they see it. Uh, don't forget to check out the, the podcast as well, a brand new episode coming out in just an hour or so's time. All right, guys, have a good session ahead and have a fantastic weekend. Take care.